Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke 11. There's a teaching that has come to the forefront called the courts of heaven. Have any of you studied it, the courts of heaven? It's an interesting teaching. I only wish that we could have had it years ago. <laughs> but we've operated in the principles of it to a certain degree and just not known it. One of the main tenets of the courtroom of heaven, and we'll look at the, pre, the three positions, if I can say it that way, of God in prayer as father, friend, and judge. But one of the principles of entering the courtroom of heaven is that there's a time to do battle out on the battlefield with the devil, the binding, the loosing, and there's a time to go present yourself into the courtroom. So it's very difficult to do battle with the devil and do binding and loosing when he's got a writ against us in the courts of our God. Let's go to Colossians. Now this makes sense to me. There's a time to do binding and loosing. And don't forsake that. One man went so far as to say, you know, it almost made it sound like binding and loosing. You know what I mean? Uh, Matthew 16, 19, whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That scripture is just as true as entering into the courts. There's such a truth that whatsoever we bind on earth is already what must be bound in the third heavens. Of course, this is predicated on the fact there's three heavens. You know that, right? There's this atmospheric heavens. That's the first heaven. Demons are, you know, wandering around, but we have authority over them. The second heaven is the stellar heavens where the stars and the planets are. And the third heaven is God's heaven. In fact, it's called the celestial planet, and you can Google it and find it on NASA, celestial heavens you'll see a picture of what the New Jerusalem looks like. So there are three heavens. So it's entirely proper for us to bind the devil when we see his footprints. We were in a, a transaction the other day, and all these things started happening. One of the devil's favorite things is to get brethren turned against each other. And I just kind of stopped everything and said, don't you see the enemy's footprints in this? Let's not war against one another. Let's bind him and get him off of our backs, which we did. But to do that, you have to kind of, how shall I say this? You have to make the courtrooms of heaven your place to be. When you're out of sorts with yourself, with God, or with anybody else, the first place you go is into the courts of our God. So, Chronicles 2.14. Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, he wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which are contrary to us. And he's taken all the writs that the devil, the accuser of the brethren, would write against us, He's taken them out of the way because he nailed those writs that were against us to the cross. You must remember, though, everything is legally true and then vitally true. Salvation is legally true, but there are still people going to hell because they didn't make that vital truth, that legal truth, vital in their experiential life. They didn't take it to heart and make it theirs. So our job, our full, total job, shall we say, as priests and kings on earth is to uphold what Jesus did on the cross. What he paid for, we uphold it in our lives. And we can uphold it in the lives of others to a certain extent. But then their will comes into play too. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, it's true that Jesus, for once and for all, took all writs that the devil would ever use against us. He took them out of the way by nailing them to his cross. 
and he went to hell, and he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from the devil. Must have been a ruckus down there with his glory shining through. And when God the Father put, raised him out of that place with such glory, and he gave the keys to the church, Matthew 28. However, we still have to uphold that verdict, shall we say, in our own lives. Because the devil will still try to write writs against us. And we have to uphold the fact, no, you're not going to accuse me. The Bible says to agree with your adversary quickly in the way. In other words, when you get convicted of something, you know, you could pass it off, you could try to wipe it underneath the carpet, sweep it underneath the carpet, or you could just say, I'm guilty. Agree with your adversary in the way. I'm guilty. I did that. I had that attitude. I said those words. Father, I repent. Please forgive me. I humble myself before you. Please wash me in the precious blood of Jesus. The strongest defense you have in the courts of our God is repentance and washing in the blood. Repentance and washing in the blood. Satan can't gainsay you. Go to, we'll just briefly look at some scriptures that we've looked at before, but they're important. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. That's beauty. That's beautiful right there. It's beautiful in truth. It's beautiful in actuality. It's beautiful in experience because it's already happened. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. That day will come in the future. That has not yet come. However, using the name and repentance and the blood, we cast him down in our own lives experientially every single day. That's our job. Now, you have to recall Jesus, or God the Father, is a righteous judge. Genesis 18, 25, Abram said, is not the ju will not the judge of all the earth do right? Exactly, he will always do right. So there is a place where we have to come with legal protocol when we come before the judge. But here's what gets me. The, the cards are stacked, so to speak, if I can use a worldly expression, because the judge is our father. We're spawned from the judge. The judge has already granted us all grace, all mercy by the blood. So the deck is stacked in our favor at all times. The only reason it wouldn't be in our favor is if we're recalcitrant and we refuse to repent or acknowledge our sin. Then we have a problem with the judge. If God, the Holy Spirit, and he is God, never forget that, and he is the spirit of truth. If God, the Holy Spirit, convicts us of sin and we, and we hide it, we wipe it away, say, that's not me. That's so foolish. Just repent. You know, I'm telling you, one of the finest treasures in life is staying humble before God, saying, I own up to that. I did that. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I wash in the blood. My best defense before you as judge is the blood of your own son and my repentance and humility to say, I did that. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And you know, when you and I ask people's forgiveness, one of the best ways to do it is to say, I was wrong. I'm at fault. Please forgive me. It's so important to complete that not just sorry. Sorry is a lazy man's way and a, a man or a woman who can't be humble to just say, sorry. Well, let's just say the whole thing. I'm so sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Now you've completed the whole repentance cycle, if I can use that word. So verse 11, Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame... The adversary, the accuser, 
He's always accusing us about something. The accuser, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. One of the things the word of the testimony is, is we can bring scripture to bear in front of his face and make him bow to the word of God. Because remember, the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus' name, one of his many names and one of his many crowns is Revelation 19. The word of God as a name is written on his thigh. It's not like it's written on his pant leg, you know, like he's wearing some kind of breeches. No, it's engraved in his thigh that he's the word of God. So when we bring the word of God to bear to the accuser, we're bringing Jesus Christ, making him face up to the Lord Jesus Christ in us. Never forget, the Lord, yes, he's in heaven, but he's also in you. He's not that far away. Besides, our citizenship is in heaven. And so we live and move and have our being from heaven to earth. And if you haven't learned this secret, I am beseeching you, learn to live from heaven. Don't just live on earth. Living on earth is so restrictive. When you live just from earth, you've got to stretch to believe all the rights and privileges that you have in Christ. But when you live from your seated position in Christ, looking down on the devil, you're fully aware because you're in your throne chair, you know. So you're fully aware of all your rights and privileges, your strength, your power in the name. Because we're seated in Christ, not just next to him. You have to get this concept. We can, when I get dressed in the spiritual armor, you've probably heard me many times, a wash in the blood, ask forgiveness. First, I come before the courts with praise and thanksgiving, Psalm 100, verse 4. Wash in the blood, eye gates, ear gates, things you hear that you don't want to hear, things you see you don't want to see, things you say you don't want to say. You wash yourself. You wash your inward man, your outward man. Now, you can go up into heaven and sit down in Christ. You have to learn to sit down in him, not beside him, in him. John 17 says we're one with him. We're one with God the Father and we're one with him. Now you're ruling and reigning from heaven because you're in Christ. You know, you're a whole lot bigger when you're in Christ than if you were just seated next to him. You've got all his power all his velocity in the spirit, his thinking processes, and because you have the mind of Christ, because you read the Bible. So we overcome the accuser in the blood of the lamb, in the Bible, the word of our testimony, the scriptures we bear, come to bear, and also what we say about our plight, whatever it is. You and I will only rise as high as our confession. So if we call things as though they are, then that's all the higher you're going to go. We have to call, Romans 4.17, we have to call those things that be not as though they are. Do you get the difference? You can't just go around saying, well, I'm poor. I'm bereft. I'm rejected. I'm this, that, and the other thing. You're calling things that are. According to Romans 4.17, you have to call those things that be not. So whatever your present state is right now, don't call yourself that. Call yourself what the Word says about you. It will get you off the hook of living in this present condition that you're already stuck in. But if you say, let's say you're sick, I'm sick, that's where you're going to be. And then we looked at Job. We'll look there very quickly. Job is a problematic book in many ways, but it actually happened. <laughs> you know, you'd like to say, let's, let's just, like Thomas Jefferson used to cut out the scriptures he didn't like. <laughs> I think there's a curse that goes with that in the book of Revelation where it says, cursed is anyone who takes away from the books of this prophecy. I hope he made it to heaven. So we're not going to hide from the book of Job. 
But I do want to show you that Satan will accuse the best of them, including Job. Job was upright in all of his ways. And it says in verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God, probably the angels of God, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So Satan came to accuse Job. We'll always have the accuser. Now, here's the point I want to make. Let's go back now to, that's just a little catching up. Let's go back now to Luke 11. We have to realize that God presents himself to us in prayer in three different ways. As a benevolent father, as a friend, and as a judge. I don't know about you, but I hang out with God the Father all the time as my buddy, as my friend, as my best friend, as my father, but as my best friend. But there are times when I have to go to him as judge. So let's see where we can see this in the Bible. Luke 11. Now it came to pass as he was praying, Jesus was praying in a certain place that he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven. This shows us how to pray to God as our Father. Hallowed be thy name. You always give him praise to enter his courts. Your kingdom come. That's saying, God, I want your perfect will in my life. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me live as if I'm in heaven, but let it come to earth so that I can walk in your preordained plan for my life. That's what prayer is all about. There are books that have been written about us. And we'll look at that in another session. But when we pray, we are literally, and that's, this is what prophecy is. When a prophet prophesies over a person's life, they are reading or seeing or being granted the impetus to take what is written in that person's book of life and to speak it out in the now to that person. It's quite amazing, if you ask me. It's a word of wisdom, can be a word of knowledge, and it's discerning of spirits in operation. So our Father in heaven, this is praying to God the Father, forgive us our sins, and we also forgive everyone who has sinned against us. You know, if we don't forgive people their sins, you won't get anywhere in prayer. Have you ever hit a, a bronze closed door in prayer? How many of you ever, have you ever, you couldn't even get off the ground in prayer? And then the Holy Spirit, precious as is nature, the spirit of truth, truth-bearing spirit, he'll say, remember that grudge you've got? Remember you kind of don't like that person and you're holding something? So then you get that dealt with and you've got an open door into heaven. So sometimes when you're trying to bang away on the door and get in to heaven, so to speak, ask the Lord, is there anybody I hate, have animosity, a grudge, bitterness, resentment, enmity towards? Ask him that question. We shouldn't have to bang on the door. The door is open to the righteous. In fact, hold your place there and go to Revelation 4. We have to see heaven as, as this verse states it. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Now, this is John the Revelator, and he's going up to heaven, and he'll be given a revelation about the end times. But the point I want to make is that the door to heaven is standing open to the righteous unless we have transgressed, unless we have enmity against someone, we're, we haven't forgiven someone. So I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Do you know that God our Father is always saying, come up here. He's always calling for us to come up and be with him. He's relentless in calling to us, come up here. 
Do you hear his cry? Do you hear his cry? Do you feel his nudges on the inside, kind of like elbowing you, the Holy Ghost elbowing you on the inside? Come up here. If you don't live a lot of your life coming up to heaven, you are missing the grandeur of, of, of life in the Spirit. So much will pass you by just because you don't go on up to heaven and present yourself before the throne and fellowship with your heavenly Father. I'm telling you, he's one reason I like him so much. <laughs> That's an understatement, <laughs> you understand? Because he's so, he's so big, he's so giant. He's so huge. He has all the power. So that door to heaven, it's not closed to you unless there's unforgiveness or unless you have sin in your life. And then it's just a small thing to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I repent deeply. Wash me in the blood. I wash my heart. How dare I have suspicions about your faithfulness? Do you know this is one of the big things that God's people need to wash in the blood about? When we get in a trial or a crisis, one of the first things we say in our hearts, we don't say it out loud. Bet you anything we don't say it out loud, but we say, aren't you going to be faithful to me in what you promised me? We have suspicions and disputations about God's faithfulness. We have to wash in the blood about that. Now go back to Luke 11. So we see that God is a benevolent father. We talk to him as a benevolent father. And you must have a relationship with God the Father and see his benevolence. How many of you have a good relationship with God the Father? You know, for me, I had to go back home after college, after all the intellectual stuff and the getting two degrees and being, you know, this intellectual mystic. I had to go back home, and, and God said to me, well, I've told you this story. Jesus came into my apartment one day. I was getting my master's degree in English. He came into my apartment, and he walked around the room, and by then I melted on the floor. I couldn't have get up. I couldn't have gotten off that floor to save my life. He's walking around the room, and he's talking to me, and he said, you will go home, and you will submit yourself to your dad. Now, I'm, I'm a college graduate from crying in the soup. Who, 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 who does he think he is? I, I have all this knowledge, a lot of it's stupidity. And he says, and you will go home and submit to your father. What he was saying is, which I didn't know at the time. Uh, let me finish quoting him. He said, you will go home and you will submit to your dad. And if you don't, your life is expendable, and I will take you home. Now, who's going to say, no, I'm not going to do it? You tell me that. But what I didn't know was that I had to go home and submit to my dad, God was saying, and I want you to get a relationship with your earthly dad and get your heart mended about childhood issues. My big childhood issue was... <laughs> When I was two or something, one, I had infantile paralysis, and I kept falling. I couldn't walk. And so my dad would put me on his knee and make me eat porridge. And my brother was a taxidermist at that time, you know, just for play. He was a kid, you know. And, I, and he would put the brains of the things that he cut open, he would put the brains in the freezer. And those brains looked just like that porridge. And so I thought my dad, you know, I'm only one or two. I thought my dad was making me eat, you know, bird brains, <laughs> literally. And so I got ought against my dad. It's stupid. I'm only one or two. And so I got a grudge against him for making me eat that hideous stuff that I thought was, you know, bird brains, gopher brains, whatever it was. And that little grudge 
inside of me festered. And I remember the day I said, I hate my dad. He forced me to eat that, those bird brains. <laughs> I know it's stupid, but look, things happen to us as children. And so when Jesus said, you will go home and submit to your dad, he was saying, you're going to go home, you're going to get your relationship with your dad healed, and you're going to become best friends with him because the day will come when you will be best friends with my heavenly father, but not unless you can get it right on earth with your own dad. That's what he was saying. So I want to say to anybody who has a grudge or a conflict with their dad, if, if your dad is still alive, get it right. Because you can't, it's very difficult to move past your relationship with your earthly dad to a relationship with your heavenly father. And because I obeyed, I didn't obey because I was such a good kid. I obeyed because he told me he would take me home if I didn't obey. So I moved home. You know, I have my own apartment. I'm getting my master's degree, blah, blah, blah. That didn't mean a thing to Jesus. And I submitted to my dad, and the Lord said to me, now, I want you to talk to him about every big decision that you're going to make. I want you to go sit down and talk to him. I want you to form a relationship where you begin to talk to him and fellowship with him. So that's what I did because I didn't have a choice. Now, because I obeyed, I have the most extraordinary relationship with God the Father. I, I wish I could even explain how exquisite it is. So I have seen over the course of these years I know people, even now I'm thinking of someone. She cannot get close to God the Father because her father, her own dad, was a military man, and he was very strict and harsh, and it was always barking out orders. Now, that's the, the, her thought about what her heavenly father's like, and she can't get past it. She can't get her heart healed. He's dead now. But there is a way, and I have no idea why I'm talking about this. Oh, my goodness sakes. One of the things I had to do, I went to Lutheran Family Services. It was when I was living at home then, and I was, they were counseling me how to get over a grudge or a, a hurt, a wound in your heart when the person is dead. My dad wasn't dead yet, but he was kind of dead to me. So the man, he was the nicest Christian man. He said, I want you to put your dad in a chair, and I want you to talk to him. Tell him everything he did wrong to you. Tell him every grudge of your heart. Tell him all the secrets of your heart, how you loathed him and hated him for making you eat porridge, and, you know, a couple other things. My dad was a good dad. He was an excellent father. But for some reason, I had these grudges. This counselor said, you tell him everything in your heart to, you put him in a chair and you talk directly to him. He may be in heaven, he may be in hell. You talk directly to him and you tell him every grudge, every secret of your heart of self, of loathing him for whatever he did. And my dad didn't do much bad to me. So I did that. I got it all out. I mean, I just lambasted him. I got everything out. One time as a little teeny girl, maybe third grade, second grade, I was waiting for my girlfriend to call me. We were gonna, her name was Lucille. We were gonna walk to school together. So I was sitting right there waiting for the phone call. The phone call came and my dad said, oh, she's resting or something and hung up the phone. So I missed walking to school with Lucille. That was a grudge. I'm talking picky any things. But anyway, I got them all out. Then the man said, he, start, he was over on the other side of the hall, or of the other side of the room. He said, I'm going to walk towards you as your dad. I'm going to be your dad. And I want to see how you're going to respond to your dad. This is a litmus test to see if I had forgiven my dad. You can do this with your mother. You can do this with anybody. So he started walking towards me, and I started walking towards him. I think his name was Chip just the nicest counselor, godly counselor. And I got up to him, 
We met in the middle of the room. There are other people around. Now, I had the decision. Had I forgiven my dad? I got it all out of my heart to my dad. So I reached out and hugged that man, and he hugged me. And the whole relationship was healed. This is something that you can do for anybody that's dead or alive. Maybe you can't get to them. You must do this so that you can have an access point to God the Father. Because you've got to know God as friend and father, and you have to know him as judge because the judge of all the earth will always do right for you. But if you can't meet him on the terms of friend and father, how are you going to go into the courtroom and, and respect his judgment or respect or, or love him or cherish him or believe him enough to talk to him about your court case? You won't be able to. Now, I just want to look at the passage of God as friend. Well, maybe we'll stop here. Let's stop here. These things that we go through in life, if it happened to you as a two-year-old, a five-year-old, 10, 12, doesn't matter, that little person is still on the inside of you. Do you realize that? That little person is still, still has the same anguish, the same unresolved conflict. And that's why to make this open door of Revelation 4.1 accessible to you, this is one of the ways, and it's a practice that you can do. For some of you, you had mothers that were terrible mothers. Start here. Put that mother in a chair. Tell that mother everything that she did to you that was wrong. The abandonment, the issues, putting you in the middle of strife and beatings. and Tell it all. Get it all out. But the last thing you must say to that mother once you get all of this out is, Mother, I forgive you. You had your own issues. You were abused, and you've just passed it on to me. And if you need help with this, we're here to help you. This is one of the things we do is the healing of memories. You know, there's all kinds of healing. Healing of the body. There's healing of the soul. There's healing of the memories. And this is one thing we help people with. But I want to encourage you. Please walk through that open door in heaven. Please go on up on high. Get these issues with your parents. Or maybe it was an aunt that raised you. You know... Our dear Rosie, Cloyce's first wife, she was our best friend. And I just learned recently when her cousin came down that her aunt, Rosie, died of cancer. I want to tell you this. I want to close with this. Rosie died of cancer on her inward parts, shall we say. Her aunt raised her, and her aunt had a monster living in her and she would make Rosie as a little teeny girl maybe four maybe five years old she would take her to a busy highway or a freeway and she would tell Rosie that she had to cross the street and run from the cars and somehow make the cars miss her and then run back she made her do that if she didn't do these obscene despicable things she would lock Rosie in a closet for days without food, with spiders. No woman can handle that. You think that didn't affect Rosie and start the cancer right down there? Some people have a cancer growing inside of them. may not be physical right now, but it's a cancer on the inside. And she was so abused by this aunt. So Rosie was using the word of God to get healed, and she had all the scriptures on a notebook, and she would read them off, and she was really doing well, and one day she lost that notebook, and it just did something to her, and so the cancer, the doc, I remember we were in the doctors together, and the doctor said, well, let, it, let us just take this out, you know, you'll have a, a, a bag on the outside, what are those called? 
right on the outside. And Rosie said, no, no, I won't do that. I wanted to beat her up, didn't you? But the point is, the cancer was already in the, in, on the inside, so she wouldn't allow that, and so, of course, she started dying. And I remember days before she died, her cousin went to her and said, talk to her, and Rosie said, I will never forgive her for the things she did to me, talking about her aunt. I will never forgive her. Think about it. You as a four-year-old having to go even on 82nd, which would be bad enough, but go to the freeway, 205 or I-5, and an adult says, you have to run across this traffic and run back. And if you don't, you're going to be locked in the closet with spiders and no food. Rosie said, one of her last words were, I will never forgive her. And so we lost one of the most precious prizes on the earth was our beloved Rosie. So I want to say to you, to get through that open door of heaven, it's, it's, it's standing open now. You can see it if you have eyes to see. Some of you will never be able to go through it because you got all this garbage, these grudges, and these idiosyncratic uh, complaints against this person or that person. I'm telling you, this is one of the ways to get rid of your anguishes. Put the person in a chair. Talk to them. Tell them everything. In front of God. Do this in front of God. Do this with the power of the Holy Ghost. Say, you're the spirit of truth. I'm doing this with you. I'm getting this garbage out of me. And then you blast that person. I don't care if you use strong language. You blast that person for everything they did wrong to you. Look at the minuscule little things my dad did to me that were nothing. And I still had to blast him. <laughs> then you tell that person, I'm going to forgive you by my choice. My feelings may not line up. People don't realize forgiveness is not feelings. It's not ushy-gushy feelings. It's a choice we make. Once you blast that person and tell them everything they did wrong, then you say, I choose to forgive you, because if I don't forgive you, I'm going to the prison. Not you. I'll go to the prison. That's Matthew 18, 35 through 38. The Bible says we'll be turned over to the tormentor if we don't forgive. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him, which was forgiveness. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. There's a reason I'm saying this. I had no thought of any of this stuff. But somebody has to hear that because the door of heaven, Revelation 4.1, is open for you and you're not able to walk through it. And God the Father wants desperately to be your friend. He wants to be your father. And he wants to be your judge in a good way. Remember, the cards are stacked for us. That he will say, you are exonerated. Once we come with the blood, repentance, and the scriptures, he has to say that. And once you go through that process, then you see yourself by faith hugging that person. Just like I did with Chip. I could finally, I was released. I could hug Chip as if he were my father. And then the ensuing scenario happened when, I, you know, I graduated from college and God made me go home and then be my dad's best friend. So now God the Father is my best friend. We have the most exquisite eye-to-eye -eye conversations and, and fellowship in heaven. It's, it's like I can't even explain to you how fabulous it is. It's so real. I mean, I go there. He comes here. We're best friends. We're best buds. He's my knock-around all-time friend. I live before him at all times. If I can't see him, because I can almost always see him, if I can't see him, it's a bad day for me. I'm not talking about exalting me. I'm talking ex about exalting the kind of relationship you can have with God the Father as father and friend and not be afraid of him as judge because he's already graced us to be exonerated. 
So whoever this is, if you need help with this, you make an appointment with us, and we'll do this with you. If you want to do it alone, do it alone. But get the job done. You've got to have this kind of relationship with God the Father. He's magnificent. He's funny. He, he, he's not a staid, you know, character like we read in a book. He is the most interesting, fascinating, lovable, kind. He's so kind and generous and personable, and you've got to know him like this.